I really didn't even have any intention of doing this. It just kind of amped up because I released one song, Chaos Magic, which was a big deal for me because it was I hadn't done anything before that night. And I kind of felt like I was redefining myself, even though to a large extent, all it did was make people go, oh, he did write all the Chromax songs. But that should be obvious to anybody who owned Age of Coral because it says right on the album, all songs written by Paris Mayhew and that other guy. <laughs> Ghost Cult Magazine back in with a, a legend, a legit legend of hardcore and music and video and film. Paris Mayhew, how are you doing today? I'm great. Thanks for getting together on your day off. I appreciate it. It's, uh, th there's really never, as you know, in the music business, there's really no days off. But uh, I appreciate you greatly for taking some time with us. Obviously, I'm giddy to talk to you. I've followed your whole career. I saw you for the first time at CB's, like back in the day, uh, you know, like so many fun things. I'm a I'm a, a relapsed New Yorker, as I like to say. I live in California now, but I'm from the Bronx and I, I lived in Brooklyn for a spell. And uh, yeah, you have a brand new album out from your new project, The Agros. This record is... I grew up in the Bronx, too. Did you? That's right. And uh, whereabouts? I lived on uh, Davidson and North, which is basically like Jerome and 183rd yeah. Street, 183rd Street with my stop. I went to St. Nicholas at Talentine. I went to PS91. Yeah, we would my, we would be like my mom, went to, my mom went to St. Nicholas at Talentine. Same yeah. school. That's crazy. My parents were from the Lower East Side originally, and they moved to the Bronx mistakenly. I'm from the PJs. I grew up by the two train, White Plains Road and AD Avenue. So... You know, Bronx Botanical Gardens, Bronx Zoo, just just to hop across the Deegan from where you were. Right. The Deegan. The I Deegan. When, when I remember as a little kid, my grandmother would say the maid, the Deegan, the Deegan, you know, with her thick accent. And then then you'd see the signs that said Major Deegan. And as a little kid, you know, when you were trying to put things together, I'd be like, Major Deegan. Is that like a really big Deegan? Because like, <laughs> I didn't know what a Deegan was. But anyway. Right. In, uh, in junior, Bronx history. Yeah, in junior high school, we used to refer to the burgers at lunch as the Deegan Burgers. So the Major Deegan Burgers. I forgot they renamed it. I, I, maybe it's something else now. But yeah, the highway. No, it's still the Major Deegan. Is it? Okay, good to know. Um, I know things get renamed. So good to talk to you. This record slams. And I just wanted to kind of um, dial it back for a second and just talk about you know, the impetus for this record, because I love reading, uh, you know, shout out to Adrenaline PR for pairing us up. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Annie, who also has tremendous roots in the hardcore scene. I love the there was like a, a little snippet of a quote from you that was like, oh, you know, I wanted to take it back to this vibe for like it literally reminds me of tapes that my friends used to pass me, not the quality, but like the raw rawness of it. You know, well recorded, sounds great, playing amazing, great songs. But it like definitely reminds you of like your tape, your homeboy, sl you know, slid you and said, like, yo, go check out my new band. Right. Because it feels like it's, it's you know, hardcore has been around oh, 45, almost 50 years. But it's it's cool when you hear something that sounds fresh and brand new. At least me. Yeah, I mean, you know. To a large extent, it's kind of like maybe the spine of the music is hardcore, but I've dressed the body with a lot of other elements um, and dressed it up in a way where to some people maybe on the outside because they see the the jacket and the slacks, they don't realize that it, it really is at the core um, what I've always done. You know, I, I guess when I was writing the music for Age of Quarrel, for example, I was just kind of like, brute forcing my way through understanding what I was capable of. And I just guess I had a natural sense of melody within that context, which made it, that music stand out. So when I, I started approaching writing these songs, um, I didn't really do it as the, as an idea of maybe uh, being a collection of an album or anything. I was just, you know, just doing my thing, picking up my guitar, enjoying myself. I, I, you know, I'm so immersed in my work in the film business. You know, I work 13, 14 hours a day, sleep all weekend for years at a time. You know, I work on a TV show for six months at a time and it becomes a blur. But when I would when I would find myself uh, applying myself to my music or my writing or anything, I just kind of like put that filmmaking hat away and just tried to focus on uh, on the music. And, you know, the knee jerk reaction is just to go with what I know often. And I just love combining chords to make them as heavy as possible and, and figuring out a way to attack it. Um, but I never I would never write another song. I would never write another world piece. It, it just my I would bypass it as I was writing because I just didn't want to uh, I wouldn't want to tell the same exact story. 
I just feel like uh, that is a, that is just a, a go-to way to create a spine. And and if I found myself layering things on top of a riff like that, and it became something else, then it would appeal to me, and I would continue with it. Uh, and then, of course, just there it's really hard to it's like now that i look back on an album it's completed you know i i really didn't even have the intention of doing this it just kind of amped up because i released one song chaos magic which was a it was just a big deal for me because it was i hadn't done anything before that and i and i kind of felt like i was redefining myself even though to a large extent all it did was make people go oh he did write all the chromatic songs but that should be obvious to anybody who owned age of coral because it says right on the album all songs written by paris mayhew and that other guy but my name is listed first, which is the significant uh, order because I was the primary songwriter. But um, then all of a sudden, you know, over the years I had done, I had been writing songs and jamming with people here and there. And I kind of collected pieces of those things. Like one day I jammed with Roy Mayorga at his house and we laid down tracks for a song. And when the session was done, he just he just handed me a drive with the session, which I didn't expect. And he said, he, like, this is my gift to you. And uh, I, I took that session and I put it in a drawer and it sat there for years because I was playing with this other guy who in his studio, we recorded a bunch of basic tracks with just guitar and drums because I was just really, again, trying to redefine what I was doing. I, I must have written 100 songs in the past 10 years, but, uh, you know, I, I whittled it down to the ones that I thought told a cohesive story. But I got that story by doing it in increments. You know, I did those three songs with Cobbs. I did that one song with Roy Mayorga, and I had some old tracks that I I, I refurbished. And then I uh, I had my friend Pete, Pete Asarisi one day. He was telling me, I'm moving to California. I won't be seeing you anymore. I said, oh, shit, let's go into the studio. And I booked a recording studio, and we went in, and we recorded the, the, the song Ghosts of New York, which is the second half of City Kids. And that session sat in a drawer for a couple of years too, until I, until I, I, until chaos magic was out. And then suddenly there was a sense of urgency. I said, wow, I wonder, I wonder what I can put together here. So I enlisted my friend, Vin, the, uh, the engineer, and we went into the studio and we just started layering and putting songs in sequence and getting rid of this and keeping that. And the next thing you know, it, it took shape and I it totally didn't expect doing it. But this is it. And like, man, I'm, I couldn't be happier. It's it's the only time I've ever made a record where I felt from the minute the the, the needle hits the groove till it ends. At the, it's just exactly the way I wanted to do it. I mixed and remixed and changed and added stuff and brought Chuck Lenahan in. It's like whenever I felt like, you know, because I wasn't on a record company schedule, nobody was going to tell me, no, you can't have more money or you can't do this. I was taking every dime of this out of my own pocket. So I just, I would, if I thought a song didn't make sense, or if I listened back to a mix that I had done a month before, like, ah, oh, and I call up Vin and I say, hey, you know, I think mix number 36 out of 200, I think we were on the right track with mix 36. And we would go back and just start again, you know, because I had the freedom to do that. And then, you know, waiting for this, you know, waiting for this to be manufactured is, is a long, long time. So I remember when we got to a certain point in the mixing schedule and I said, I gotta, I have to start doing the research. And I did the research and I found the place that I was going to have manufacture it. And then I, you know, and 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 when I was looking at this timetable, then I was like, oh, you know, I should do the album cover. So once I get to the, you know, once I get to that point, I have to get to that point. And, and that's just these things that I do on the weekend when I'm not working, you know, and it's, you know, uh, it's, it's a lot to unpack asking a question like that because I didn't do it in one one session. It was like literally not only. Uh, uh, it was a different mindset every time I approached a song. When I was doing Chaos Magic, I just felt the need to complete this one thing, and 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 really by that time, I had tried. I didn't really have a band, so I was trying to put the music in a context. Like, what what can I do with this song if I didn't have a band? And then I started thinking, well, I'm in the film business. Maybe I could have a TV show about a band, and this could be one of their songs. Well, what would the show look like? So I started making the video for Chaos Magic with the 100% with the idea in mind that I need to make the video so people will understand what the TV show would look like. I want it to look like dark New York. I want it to look like New York of my youth. And I want it to, it, you know, because when, when a cinematographer, for example, or a director is hired to do a film, they do a lot of experimenting and camera tests and they and they establish the look, the colors, the feel, the texture of a film. And I jumped into doing that 
that because that's just the way I know things are done. And even though I didn't have a producer saying, I want to make this thing, I just figured if I could jumpstart the whole thing. And then I had this video and me and my wife are literally watching it back, like both going, like, because I was so immersed in doing it, I wasn't really paying attention to what I was doing, which I think to a large extent was a self-defense mechanism because, you know, as I, as I've said before, you know, one of the things I was facing when making new music is I was facing an undefeatable foe, nostalgia. There's so many people that have nostalgic feelings about the music I made in my past that they can't help but come to the table with expectations. And I, and I, I don't mind them having those expectations, but I just didn't know if it was something that could be overcome. So I tried to put the music in a context that separated myself from it. So I, I created this band name, Agros, which was the name of the band in the story. And I started writing treatments for the story and I started writing songs for the story. But as soon as that video was done and it was just me standing there playing bass, playing guitar, running around, you know, my wife just looked at me and she goes, I don't even know what you're thinking with this TV show. You, we must put this out immediately. And that's and that's how we that's the answer to your question. <laughs> Sorry, if you ask me a question, you just got to wait. Thank you for unpacking all that for us. Uh, you know, first and foremost, I'm so stoked that you have vinyl because it's so, like you said, so hard to get vinyl these days. If it's not already sold out, we'll link everything in the description anyway, where people can try to get it. I hope I hope they sell it out for you. But that's great. Well, and um, well, well, the, I'm, I'm glad you asked about that, because one of the things about this is this isn't on a record label. Like I did this all myself. This is the I, I, I told the manufacturers, I said, listen, man, I want this record to be as nice as any Rush album I ever bought in my life. Is any Led Zeppelin or any Prince or anything? When I hold this in my hand, I don't want anybody to have to say, "Oh, the inner sleeve is kind of—it's uh, always just a white inner sleeve." I went big. I, I mean, the material that they use to make the inner sleeve is almost as thick as the cover. I got colored vinyl. I got the best artists I can find. I mean, look at that cover. You know, because you know, I'm I'm at an I'm a, I'm of an age or an era where this holding the record and looking at it and reading it over and over and over again even down to the way you know the colors of the of the the song titles and and just i just wanted it to feel like an experience every time he looked at it and and, and man could i have not found better people than andrew montserrat to make this amazing cover and sean taggart who i went to high school with but is a became a subsequently became a uh, artist of note in in a big way and then uh, Andrew Sawyers, he's a London comic book artist, does Judge Dredd and things like that. And he did this. And it's just, uh, I couldn't be happier with this because I feel like visually, this is just as important as the music. And uh, I hope people feel, I mean, people have been telling me they feel that way, but I'm glad they do. Shout out to uh, Art and Design High School in New York City, still, still banging around and the product of many, uh, many a legend of music as well ironically or unironically funny, I just, my my you know if you if you know the city kids video like all the when you see uh the skateboards on the on the buildings and stuff a lot of people ask me oh how'd you do that it's like visual effects i was like no that's actually projected on the sides of buildings sometimes i i i composited like when the empire state building's there you know of course i don't have it i'm not projecting on the empire state building but i, I did that but most of that stuff is literally projected because i have a friend who has a company called Scenester, and they do all this like 3D mapping of buildings for advertising, you know, for like Ralph Lauren and all these big companies and uh, DKNY. And then they'll do advertising projection. They do it all over the world. And one day my friend Frank uh, calls me up and he says, hey man, I just got a new projector and I want to test it tonight. Do you have any content you want to project? And I had just gotten those NFTs from NFTY Skateboards, uh, Paul and Ollie in Germany, who so generously created uh, lent their art also to my project and made these nfts and i didn't even know what an nft was my wife got it done because my wife knew them from germany my wife is german and when i saw these things and like the spinning around and their skateboards and like i'm a skateboarder all my life and all i could think it was this is so fucking cool what do you do with it you know because i didn't really understand the concept of an nft and there is frank calling me up on the phone and i said yeah yeah can you project an nft he's like sure so I met him at like 11 o'clock at night when he finished projecting his ad for whatever it was. We popped in the NFTs and they popped up on the sides of these buildings. And I just started, and he says, you have 30 minutes. So I spent 30 minutes, like literally I'd set up a shot, like run like 
20, you know, just a full rotation of the skateboard, which seemed to take forever when I was shooting it. Cause I was like, I gotta get another shot. And I would run down the block, <laughs> set up the camera, go through a fence. And I, and I was, I was, I managed to get about, I'd say 10 really good shots and it changed my video. I mean, just that whimsical little thing of a generous friend saying, Hey, can you want, you got something I can project, you know, and to a large extent, that's how all, all this stuff came together. The artists, you know, I saw this, I saw this painting on Facebook. It was somebody's, it was somebody's, you know, wall or wallpaper that whatever they call it. It wasn't exactly this one. It was one very much like it. So I wrote the guy and I said, Hey man, what is, what is that for? And he goes, it was Andrew Montserrat. He said, Oh, I made it for my son. And I said, Oh, he goes, yeah, it's hanging in his dorm or something. And I said, Oh, he goes, why do you ask? I was like, I don't know. I just looking for art that to rep to kind of like back up or support my music. And that just, you know, that's just, you know, I'm a New Yorker. I feel like my videos have uh, kind of established this, you know, motif of the music. And I want to continue that thread with the art. And he goes, oh, I'll do one for you, too. I said, what do you mean? He goes, I'll just do another one. I said, you'll do another one of these? I mean, look at this. I mean, I mean, it's this big, too. And all that detail, he goes, yeah, but he goes, but if you notice, there's like store signs all, all over the place. He goes, give me a list of places that you used to go. And I'll just customize the drawing for you. And he did that. And it's it's like unbelievable. What are some of those places? I'm dying to know. A7. Of course. Which, you know, Drew Stone's always talking about on his show. He was he actually had matinees in that old location where um, where Jesse Mallon's bar is. Mm -hmm. And uh, what else do we have here? The Peppermint Lounge, where I saw Black Flag and X and The Professionals, which was uh, Steve Jones and the Sex Pistols band and Susie and the Banshees. Uh, what else we got here? The Aztec, which was a bar on 9th Street and Avenue A, which was before that it was called the Park Inn Tavern, where like I used to hang out with the Beastie Boys and and Harley and Jimmy Gestapo and, you know, Uncle Al and all the people, you know, all those Lower East Side people. Pearl Paint, because we were all in art school, me, Sean Taggart, the guy who did this. We all went to art and design and we all, you know, it was like a, a whole trek to go down to Canal Street and shop at the five-story tall pearl paint where the employees would follow us around because they thought we were going to steal. Alcatraz, St. Mark's Hotel, which I, that was his putting in. Irving Plaza, New York Hardcore Tattoo. That Well, that's a modern place. Uh, Matt Umanoff Guitars. Uh, the Village Idiot. That was like my spot. My friend Tommy McNeil owned that on First Avenue and 10th Street. CBGB's, of course, Bleaker Bob's, which was the record uh, record store to go to. Now it's Generation. Generation is definitely the spot to go. They have our record, by the way. If you're in Manhattan, Yaffa Cafe, where me and my wife had our first date. Just things like that. Personalized. So amazing. Uh, I have memories of many of those places, and I love Bleaker Bob's. It was my favorite record store for a long time. A long, and now it's Generation, of course. I've been there, too. And uh, that's probably where I saw you last. I think it was... Uh, I might have been the last time I saw you in person, which is going back a few years. I think we I bumped into you there at, at an event. Yeah, this record is hella cool. It's very deep. And I and I appreciate what you said at the top, just to dial it back about the album for a second and say, like, I love that you said, you know, it's mo obviously anytime you pick up a guitar, just like whenever you pick up a camera or storyboard out something, it's going to have your DNA in it. Right. But I do appreciate that it's a very multi-layered record. It's not just a hardcore record. It's much more than that. And there's beautiful arranging on it. There's incredible piano. I do want to shout out Roy. I think a lot of people know Roy from his most popular bands like Hell Yeah and Stone Sour, but they don't know that Roy came up in the hardcore and death metal scene in New York, all of New York State, not just the city, but upstate especially. And they don't know his lineage. And, you know, you it's cool that you can call on friends and peers to come in and help you with the thing that is essentially your passion project and people want to help you. I mean, I, I can't, every piece of this puzzle, the album, you know, I think of it as a puzzle. I was just so grateful that people came and lent themselves to it, you know, with such enthusiasm and without, you know, I, my, my experience in bands has always been adversarial and always been full of, tension and negotiating to agree and just just was always unhappy I, you know that's why i didn't play music for such a long time because i really associated a lot of uh personal emotional trauma with trying to do something so hard with all my might and then having it fail just because people just 
were behind me digging holes in the boat, you know, but, um, with somebody like Roy, it was a completely different thing. And I, I have an attachment of gratitude to Roy just for that single gesture, the same way I do with Frank when he called me up and said, hey, you know, I got a projector. Let's project on the wall. You know, it's like we took 30 minutes that day and it affected my life so much because it made my video so much cooler. It made it look like Blade Runner, you know, and um, but, what you know, I was in L.A. I did, you know, one of those goofy things that people do. I, I posted on Facebook like uh, LaGuardia to, J to uh, LAX, you know. And uh, when I landed, there was a text from Roy said, hey, you in L.A., did you bring your guitar? And I said, yeah. And he said, oh, do you do anything tomorrow? I said, what, why? He goes, come over and let's jam. And so the next afternoon, me and my wife went over to Roy's place. And uh, he's got this little like a, a, a extra house, the extra small house in his backyard that has a little recording studio in it. And it's all. And it's all, you know, it's amazing. You know, you look at it, it looks like, you know, a garden shack. And then you open up the door and it's, you know, every, anybody who's seen Roy on Instagram and seen his wall of synthesizers, that's in one in the control room. And then he's got the separate drum room, but he's got the whole place wired with headphones and stuff. And everything is done uh, wireless uh, with, you know, without amps. And, uh, and and that was unusual for me. He like hands me these headphones and I pick up the guitar and we're like standing in this room and and we just and he, he was like, what do you want to play? And I was like, well, you know, I'm not a cover guy. I just I always have something. So I started playing him riffs. And I had a I had a rough sketch for for Fearview Mirror. And I, and I just started playing that for him. And within two hours, we were playing it from beginning to end, like a perfect. I was like, this is this is great. And he just looks at me and he goes, he goes, well, we're all wired to go. You want to record it? And I said, Really? He goes, yeah. He goes, this is where we do all the Stone Sour uh, recording. And I said, oh, really? I, I mean, it, probably the Stone Sour demo recording. Uh, I don't know where they do the records. And then we rolled one or two takes and we listened to it back. And he said, oh, let's throw some guitars on there. Then he was he was like, oh, there's Johnny Chow's bass. Let's throw some bass on there. And in one afternoon, we finished that song pretty much the way you hear it on the record. You know, I didn't go back and re-record any of the guitars or the bass uh he just had it dialed in so well and it meshed with all the other stuff on my record and it does have a little bit of a different sound because which i liked because it is kind of like a sabbathy sludgy different take uh on on the music it definitely it, it, i think it segues out of the record into that it doesn't stick out like a sore thumb but it definitely has a completely different flavor and then I, like i said i had you know when, when when we finished jamming it was the end of the day and we had such a great time and roy just kind of like handed me a thumb drive with the with the session. I go, what's this? He goes, oh, it's the session. It's the Pro Tools session. Do you have Pro Tools? And I said, no. He goes, well, just take it anyway. And I, like I said, I threw it in a drawer. And when I when I was accumulating all these songs, I had I had everything. I had decided to do everything except for Fearview Mirror and Best Destiny. They were just two tracks I had sitting on a drive. And I started going through these drives. I'm like, where is that drive with Best Destiny on it? And I found it and I brought it down to the studio and I said to Vin, I was like, what can you do with these drums? He goes, I can make them sound like the rest of the record. And he put it in there and he played it back. And, you know, because we, we recorded all, all the drums that I recorded with Cobbs, the drummer who plays on, you know, Best Destiny and Skateboard Fight and Chaos Magic. We recorded in a storage room, you know, like you know, a keeper self storage where he had this, you know, you walked in and it was, it, it was kind of like Roy's mad scientist thing, but like on a much more low dollar level. Cause I think Roy's studio was gifted to him by John Travis, the producer, record producer who did like devil without a cause. When he retired from producing, he just, I think they just moved everything and put it into Roy's studio. Whereas Cobbs was like, you know, every, all his programs were, were you know just downloaded illegally and wires going everywhere and futons and he has kids and there's like kids toys around because his kids are always hanging around i mean but you know we rolled the tape and we we had we caught some magic and but the fact that 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 was recorded that way you know was just you know going into roy's studio seemed like a luxury but uh we all we ended up making a cohesive uh, connection between Roy's tracks and and Pete's tracks and uh, and it and it fits in perfectly. Yeah. Amazing. But you know the funny thing is Roy kept saying to me, "Oh, send me more tracks, send me more tracks." But I was playing with Cobbs, and I just I, that's why I put that drive in a drawer because I 
I did that. It was fun and everything. And we made this great song, but I wasn't going to diss my drummer by having something else. But what happened was during the pandemic, Cobbs had a lot of family obligations. He had, to, he had family to take care of, and but he had to leave New York. So he like, I think he moved down to New Orleans. So we stopped playing together. And when I was assembling all this, I didn't have that consideration anymore. I was like, yeah, let's dig out that thing and throw it on there. And 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 the odd thing is, ultimately, once the record came out, I heard from Cobbs, and he's like, hey man, what are you doing? And I was like, he goes, I heard the music, it sounds great. He goes, and I said, well, let's pick it up where we left off. So I'm touring in July, and uh, Cobbs will be the drummer. That's amazing. I'm so happy to hear that. Was one of my next questions. So thank you for the help with the segue. I was going to say, I feel like there's a really cool purity because of where you are in life now after you're you know in the, through your career the stuff you did as a young a younger person a teenager writing riffs guerrilla video making like all of that still translates today in different you know different veins you know so to speak that it's really cool that you can still do this very organic do it yourself thing i know that diy tends to be you know you know corrupted and taken over as a slogan and i use it a lot music journalists use it a lot but I think it's a, like a very cool purity and a very cool, like there's a correlation between the stuff you did 30, 35 years ago, not to age us both terribly, but to today, to this project and even other things you do. It's cool that a lot of those things still translate. Hmm. I mean, I think one of the, I mean, I have been banding around the DIY thing because I'm so proud of what I've done, but usually there's an implication with the DIY method is that it's kind of low dollar or, you know, or, you know, it's just not polished. And, you know, I work in the film business as a cameraman on huge movies and TV shows. And so when I do it by myself, even, you know, cause I made chaos magic with just one other person, this, my, my friend, Scott, we did that during the pandemic. And then city kids, I made pretty much with just my wife. But, you know, if you looked at that and you, you'd probably imagine we had a crew of 50, you know, like you would on any other shoot because it's so, there, there's so there's so much going on in those videos, but I, I you know I did the same thing. I started looking for graphic artists to put this together for me, and I just found myself like trying to imagine like calling somebody up or emailing them. It's like, can you knock the logo over just like a millimeter? Oh wait, no, go a little bit higher. <laughs> the whole by email would take forever, so I just did what I always do. I downloaded, I downloaded a or I I got a subscription to Adobe and I watched a. 10 hours of uh, tutorials. And the next thing you know, I had done this and I did the CD package and I did the posters and, you know, and the music videos and we hired Metal Maria as opposed to being on a record label. Cause it's, you know, it is a lot more work and it's, and it's, and it's a lot of work outside my lane, if you might say, but a lot of it's in my lane and all the things that people depend on a record label for, like making a music video, like I couldn't imagine because I know how music videos are made. A lot of times, you know, it depends on the budget. If you have a small budget, you end up taking people that have almost no experience and they just want to get something done for their own reasons. And 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 the parameters of the planning of of of, of a reasonable expectation of getting a video finished makes narrows your possibilities for making something interesting very small. And then it's what they think is interesting, not you. So, you know, that's why I think people are so surprised by my videos because they look like little movies. Um, so even though I am completely DIY, you know, and I did record some of this stuff in storage rooms and snuck into studios in the middle of the night and, you know, and had everybody just come in and volunteer their time. It's still the best record I ever made. I mean, we spent a boatload of money making the Chromag's Revenge album. And this is 10 times the record that record is. In my opinion, mine too, actually. And um, <laughs> two more questions for you, man. You've been so generous. I really appreciate uh, all this uh, insight and feedback. It's really great. As you mentioned, this is a you know painstaking over a lot of time in bits and pieces. I'd love to see all of these songs represented with a visualizer. They don't all need to be a, a full music video with you know production and fun things. But it'd be cool just this collection of songs if you had like a visual element for each one i think it would do real well for you is that something you thought about at all there i'm in the middle of i started about uh two months ago just to, to do a video for skateboard fight and then i broke my toe which just stopped me dead in my tracks but i will i will finish that will be the next single 
I don't know when it will be because I need it to be as good as the other videos. So I'm, I'm definitely taking my time. And then there are two more substantial songs on the record, Fear of You Mirror, which is like a seven or eight minute long song and Best Destiny, which is also of the, of a similar length. And, uh, th those songs, you know, they, I, I require there to be a real journey. So, you know, I was talking before about a music video. If you hire somebody to get it done, like they, they have to come up with one idea in one location. And that's usually what happens for the whole video of mine. It, you, you, you have to have a journey. So that journey is going to take me a little bit, a little while to construct, but I'm not on a record company schedule. I'm not on this whole thing. Like we got to get all these singles out. We got to create this thing, you know, this wave. And, and they, the only reason they want to do that is to get you high up there and throw you back into the studio again, which is fine, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to, I'm going to, I want this record to grow. I'm, I'm, I, I, you know, I re, re I redid chaos magic with Chuck Lenahan on it, which makes the, the video so much cooler and so much better. That's the first single. And then I'll release skateboard fight, do some touring. And then down the road, I'll, I'll pepper out these last two videos and they'll correspond with touring or whatever, uh, you know, or just because it's the right time. And even after, you know, and then I, the last one will be Fear of You Mirror. I feel like that's the last one I want to drop because it's that is such a, you know, a, a mental uh, mouthful. It just, yeah, I, I think that's the one I want to do last. But, uh, you know, when that's going to be, I don't know. But I don't think it matters because, like I said, I'm not on that schedule. Really, yeah, really well done. I appreciate that. Fear of You is probably my favorite track on the whole thing. But the whole thing slaps, as the kids say. And uh, I, I've been listening to it so much. I really appreciate it. Just for a last question, I, I, I know you touched on this a little bit earlier. I know that I'm sure a lot of people, like you said, nostalgia is the biggest enemy in a way uh, for a, a legacy artist like yourself. Do you, are you able to just do you are you able to just listen to your own music to age a quarrel and things like that and separate the drama from the band and just appreciate this music you made when you were really a youth, you know, your first formative music is some of the most important music in this genre of hardcore and metal ever. Are you able to just appreciate that and, and just take that in and enjoy that? Or is it just too painful? No, I, I never listened to it. Uh, and I'm unable to enjoy it. Uh, I, I'm sure that's hard for people to understand, but it, it's also hard uh, understanding, um, a narcissistic relationship when somebody spends all their effort trying to marginalize you and marginalize the way you feel even to the point where they try to take away your ability to feel proud of your own music uh and and, and to such a huge extent such a huge extent this erased all that I mean, once I sat down to listen to all this and I've been hearing the responses, I mean, it was more, more important of how I felt about the record when I listened to it back. It really erased all that, that, you know, that my former band members had spent decades <laughs> heaping on me. It literally vanished instantaneously. And you'd think, OK, now I can look back with with more of a positive feeling and listen to that music. but. It in the face of this, I just have no interest in that. I don't feel connected to that anymore. It's like this is so it, it, you know I, I've reached a completely different level of of my personal ability to accomplish something. I, I you know it, it it's gone. I, it, I've exceeded my own expectations personally, and that's just you know as a listener. Because once the record's done, I, I almost I feel disconnected from this already. It's not like it's weird. You know, you don't feel like inside the music once a record comes out. It's really. It, it really lives its own life. Uh, I mean, I guess I'll feel different about that when I start playing live. But that's how I feel. And I, I don't I, you know, I feel connected. You know what I feel connected to that old music? I feel connection to 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 the to the memories and the time I spent alone writing that music, sitting in my mom's kitchen, coming up with world peace uh, in sections, like, like coming up, I remember coming up with that riff the first time. And then, then all the subsequent riffs all, you know, because I was kind of like 
in this lane or this I, I, the rut sounds like a bad thing, but when you know a cart, you know you get into a rut, it just keeps you in this line. And I got into that uh, with that with the, with that rhythmic feel because I was trying so hard to be like Motorhead that I subsequently wrote all the riffs that lead up to the end in this very quick sequence. And I just you know that feeling of just being alone in this room and nobody hearing and never having any expectation that anybody would ever hear it because I wrote that song before the Chromags. Uh, and then even the, the, the ending part, the, you know, I thought I was writing a rush type part, you know, I, I wrote it all arpeggiated. So, and the experience of writing, you know, show you no mercy. I remember I, I had this like cheap double tape deck and my dad had given me this, like, it wasn't a Walkman, but it was a portable recorder, more of like a business thing. Like businessmen have these things so they could talk to them. And that's a very common thing now, but back then it was like a super advanced thing. So I would record into this thing, put the tape into that, play that back and then record it again, you know, with double tracking. And then, you know, and, and because that was the closest I thought I'd ever ha be to having a recording. But I remember the building of all those songs and I feel connected to that. But I don't feel connected to listening to it back uh, as a band. And, and, it, and it's not, you know, it just it's not like some big obstacle. I just don't think about it. You know, I spent I spent a lot of time, especially for the past couple of years, just listening to this over and over, listening to mixes, listening to demos. I made a thousand demos, just in my, you know, recording under my phone. This is the best tool a songwriter ever had. You know, uh, and oh, that's awesome. I just got a, <laughs> I just got a text from a friend showing me his daughter's uh, little scooter. That's a uh, yeah, I won't say who it is, but uh, that's that's amazing. We got to get some aggros. I love the baseball jersey there, the old school Raglan uh, jersey. That's the jersey. Yeah, shirt. I love those. Uh, yeah, man. Thank you for sharing all that. And again, I hope I wasn't prying too hard on some of these things. My mind goes to places and I appreciate everything you've done, including this new record a lot. And I'd love to get together with you another time and just talk about film and video. Uh, I think there would be a whole separate great conversation, but I did want to try to focus on the music, especially the new record. Congratulations, man. Thank you for chopping it up with Ghost Cult and hanging with me. It's been a real pleasure. I thank you for sharing your audience with me. I appreciate the conversation. And there's nothing personal. I mean, I mean, actually, there's everything personal about music. So asking a personal question is just the logical way to go. Because it's all, you know, there's so much, there's so much to unpack with with making music. It, it, at least it was for me because I had to untangle so many not to get myself to even apply myself to it because i you know not to belabor this but you know when i stopped playing music it wasn't like i just stopped being creative i immediately got a job in the film business and started making tv shows and that's an all come con con uh, all consuming thing so even if your confidence is like kind of like hijacked from you for doing one thing if if I was just like, oh, I could do this instead. You know, I have a degree in fine arts. So I got to go on and, you know, I could, you know. So uh, asking personal questions will get answers that I think are more relevant to people understanding the effort that goes into making music. So I thank you for those questions. Right back at you, man. Thank you so much. That means a lot to me. Have a great day. Enjoy. And we'll keep promoting the record. And I look forward to seeing you live again someday. That would be amazing. Thank you very, very much. In July.